Good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Africa Leadership Dialogues, where we discuss issues of leadership development and growth on the African continent. Now, this week we host an incredible panel of women who are already making a difference at different levels across Africa. It's a women in politics panel. I'll tell you more about them in just a few minutes. Also, you get to have your say. And as always, we have Africa's top 10 and we focus this week on representation in parliaments across Africa. Women's representation. What does it look like? All that coming up in just a short while. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishu. On the show tonight, we host a panel discussion. Our focus is women in politics in Africa. On our panel, Rabia Nijlawi, the youngest member of parliament in Tunisia. She was voted into office at the age of 22 and has been a member of parliament now for three years. Gogo Falandi, is the founder and executive director of the Pillar of Hope project based in Botswana. Gogo, also popularly known as Gigi, has been working in the development field since she was five years old. Margaret Dongo is a veteran politician from Zimbabwe with 30 years in the political arena. She was a war veteran and fought for freedom for Zimbabwe, lived in Mozambique for several years during that tumultuous period. She's been a member of parliament, but at one point was expelled from ZANU-PF for being outspoken and challenging the electoral system in Zimbabwe. She nonetheless was voted back into office as an independent candidate. Let's get their insights into women's representation in politics across Africa. Ladies, thank you all so much for finding time for the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Now, you all have experience in the political arena, different levels of experience, but highly engaged, all of you. And I want to start uh, with Margaret. You've been a, a freedom fighter. 30 years in politics it's been for you. You've been in government. Uh, you've been expelled from ZANU-PF in, in Zimbabwe for speaking about the electoral system. And then you came in as an independent, voted in, a female independent. Uh, a very powerful experience for you. But knowing all the challenges that African women in politics face, what are your thoughts on what Africa needs to do to start the changing the narrative in terms of women's representation? It's, it, it, it's a long story, but to cut the story short, what I want to say, what is most disturbing is the politics of more manifestos, party politics. Uh, what I want to say is that the political party politics has affected many women and it has it is even affected the development of, of women and empowerment of women in the sense that there is no time when women can come together and focus on uh, women, uh, women's agenda because of their political party manifestos. They have to toe the line. So for as long as that exists, this is the greatest barrier that we have. The political party manifestos, everyone else, every woman has to pay allegiance to their manifestos. So as a result, there is no way they are going to reach a common ground because they are operating on a parallel line. And I want to say the only option which I will explain further is becoming independent, an independent because you have no allegiance to any individual but your electorate and your constituents. And, that's the, the, and what I am referring to now becomes the women's constituents. Very quickly though, running as an independent presents huge challenges in terms of networking, reaching the masses, finances. True, it's the greatest challenge and it's not easy. Not only for, for the financial part of it, but to make people understand the role of an independent. People are used to a political party system and to convince them that an independent can also make a difference, it's not easy. Because, you know, they are used to political party system. So, but I think everything else we have to fight, have a look. 
at an age of 15, I was a freedom fighter, held a gun, and I moved away from that and became a civil servant. From there, I became an MP. There is, it's a process. We have to now, as feminists, we have to make sure that we raise awareness, we educate our people, our women, so that they know there is other option. The, and the option that I'm referring to is for women to go independent. That's the only way you can uh, promote a feminist approach Thank in you. terms of representation. Thank you for that, Margaret. Uh, coming straight to you, Rabia, and your experience, what do you think is the biggest barrier and how should it be addressed to women's representation? In Actually, politics? there is no one barrier. If it is one, it will be easy. But there are plenty of barriers that make women feel that uh, she's not in her field and the most important thing is that she has to start with herself because women underestimate their, themselves women think that uh, well, men should be in politics and they should be at home doing things uh, children and uh, home things and stuff so it starts with yourself. You have to start with yourself. You have to convince yourself that you can do it and you can be a politician. And as I said, that statistics show that women are better than men in politics and in management of the government. So why not to, to convince yourself and to be proud of yourself of what you are doing? Actually, I'm proud of myself. I don't need... To, to, to anyone to be proud of me or men to be proud of me. You have to, be, to believe in your capacity. So self-belief self -belief. And, and validation. You don't yeah. need external validation. Yeah. This is the most important thing. But there are other barriers. Uh, I, I, this is the emotional or psychological, but there are physical, like financial, uh, like, uh, like violence against women, like threats, because women are insulted either from uh, her counterparts, uh, male counterparts, or from their society. Uh, this is, can really uh, stop women from doing this. Let's talk about your experience. And you became a member of parliament yes. at the tender age mm -hmm. of 22. Yes, Been there now for three years, is it? Yeah. It's how, how did you achieve that? Yeah, actually, uh, as I said, it starts with a question. Why not me? Uh, and uh, this question, really, with this question, my, my story starts. So I start to, to, to investigate myself. Why, when did, when did you ask yourself the question? Yeah, it so? was when, uh, when I, uh, I, was, I was not thinking about running or elections or anything. So I have to tell you that. So I was going to the election office so that I can participate in the process of election and help the process of election. It's not running, but to, to observe as a, an observer, to, to, uh, to not worry about the election, and it's a freedom and democratic uh, election. So when I see the list of the candidates, I figure out that they are all old men. So I said, where are women? We were in the front lines in the revolution. Where are they? Where are young, young people? I said, I said, I have to, to, to forget about this participation in the election process, and they have to run for parliament. So it was a responsibility you felt yes. you needed to do because yeah. women were not there, they were not present, they were not engaged, and you realized women was you. I actually, I, I wasn't thinking about winning. My aim and my objective was that I participate so that people see that there is a woman who is participating. I, I wanted to raise the consciousness and the awareness of, of women culture, that women participate in culture, because it starts with me. I have to start it that other women can do it uh, too. When you speak to the electorate, what do they tell you in terms of why they voted for you? I went to places that I believe that men didn't go even. I did an excellent campaigning, and uh, uh, there, was, there was staff with me, good men with me, there were uh, feminist men with me who really supported me, and thanks God, because I found these people to support me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was a list uh, election, list system, and I was on the top of the list, 
and the other men are behind me and they support me. Wow, so you, you made networks and, and connections even among the men and you went to places that the other yeah. candidates I was, were not I was the to. youngest among the people, candidates on, on my list, but I was on the top. Let me come to Gigi. Uh, from that inspirational story of a very young candidate, Gigi, you are even younger than the, the 22 years old, and yes. you plan to be in office, presumably. Mm -hmm. But even more important than that, you've been engaged uh, since you were a child in trying to enhance uh, women's representation. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your experiences so far. Does society take you seriously and do you see yourself in office soon or do you think it's going to be a long journey? Yes, thank you very much, Julie, for that. Um, it has been a very long journey for me. I established my charitable foundation when I was five years old, and I can tell you that it has been the, 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 the most challenging thing ever in my life, hence it being the less road traveled. Uh, it took seven years for me to register my charitable foundation. And you know, for me, the biggest challenges have always been age and my gender. I've always been too young to achieve, too young to dream, and I've always been the wrong gender to enter into different uh, places, okay? Uh, after it took seven years for me to register my foundation, I also had a challenge about um, me being an activist and advocate, particularly at school and in society, because you know we categorize, we have stages of what we deem to be a child, an adult, a mature person. So I was just that uh, child who was expected to be watching cartoons on TV, yet I was out there could, uh, speaking out about children's rights, responsibilities, what is happening in society. I was once told to stop doing philanthropic work because it was said to be a duplication of what the government was already doing. Yet it is all in clear view that although our government is putting in efforts, it can never be enough. We are citizens and we have the social responsibility to contribute to the development of our country. And then, I was told that I shouldn't sing the national anthem of Botswana during my uh, philanthropic and activism initiatives. Why? Because I was a nobody who does not deserve uh, the honor of singing the national anthem of Botswana. I was told to stop doing charity and advocating for children's rights. I can tell you right now as I'm sitting here, I've been taken to a number of psychologists in Botswana and South Africa because many people thought I may possibly be mentally unstable. And to an extent that even my parents started to question my, my, my sanity. Uh, but, um, you know, it's important to accept that there are people who are gifted in different ways. When you saw, when you could see Wolfgang Mozart playing the piano at four years old, mm -hmm. you'd be amazed and think a four year old playing a piano at that age, where did he get all that? It's the same as me when I was five years old and I stood in front of an audience and I said, this is right and this is wrong. Society, what are we doing about these challenges? It is the same as me as five years old and saying, there's something that needs to be done and I'm not gonna point the finger at the government or at NGOs, I am gonna do it. Starting with the man in the mirror as Michael Jackson said. So I think for me the biggest challenges have been the misconception or perceptions that in society culturally also have been a big problem. I can tell you that when I was just about 11 years old, I decided to go around the country addressing khutla meetings. Now khutlas, for, for those who may not know, are traditional settings where it, they're led by the chiefs. It's a gathering place traditionally where uh, women come in dresses and skirts. You can enter when you're wearing pants. And then also usually the men speak and the women just listen. And when I went and said to the whole nation of Botswana that I wanted to go around addressing Kotla meetings, I can tell you that even agencies, NGOs that stand up for children's rights were saying there is no way you are doing that because you are too young and you are a girl. But despite that, there was no law in the constitution of Botswana that could stop me from doing that. So I went ahead. And I can tell you that in one of the courtlets I went to, when I entered, even though my name, Hukhon Jang is quite a feminine name, I think uh, the expectation was that a boy would come who's also much older. When I walked in, everybody stood up and looked and said, is that a girl and a child? 
And the chief said, there is no way you are addressing a Qutla meeting in my Qutla because I thought that you are older and let alone a man and even probably belonging to the royal family. And I just said, just give me five minutes. If after five minutes I'm talking about how as children we are being abused and how our parents should stop using corporal punishment or I'm going on and on about what I've seen on Sesame Street, I give you the full permission to kick me out of your Qutla. And I can tell you that that chief, after I addressed the Khutla meeting, he called me back the second time to address an even bigger gathering in his Khutla. And the following year, during the Independence Day celebration, I was the guest speaker. And so let me ask you, and I'll bring this question to Margaret and to Rabia as well. What examples have you seen across Africa that inspire you, that make you feel energized, because you can see now the possibilities for women on the continent? Definitely. Well, I believe starting locally before globally, so I'll start in my home country. I've been greatly inspired by a woman of substance, Honorable Dr. Margaret Nasha, who's the first speaker of the National Assembly of Botswana. We also have Dr. Atalia Molokume, who's the first woman attorney general of Botswana. And then going out, I've been inspired by the great and late uh, Dr. Wangari Mathai for, be, for having the Nobel Peace Prize. And it shows that it is indeed possible for us as African women. I have been inspired by Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf because it shows that it is possible for us to have the first in Africa and probably even the first in the whole world. And right here as I am in Malawi, another great source of inspiration, Her Excellency President Joyce Banda, with such inspiration that may look like it's not a lot of numbers to inspire a lot, but it's inspiring a whole new generation of young women who have uh, in the in the minds that they can, it is possible. Because you need to know that for us to walk that road, we need to have seen the footprints that somebody has been there. Mm -hmm. And then we have confidence, we have mm -hmm. strength, we have belief. That's why these people are called inspirations, motivators, success stories. Because I look at myself and I look at uh, uh, President Joyce Banda and I ask myself, when she was my age, probably she had the same mindset I'm having right now. And if she did it decades later, why can't I do it two decades less? Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. When you look at Africa right now, what is exciting? What organizations are doing the right things? Uh, have you seen policy changes that excite you? What in the environment do you see that makes you feel there is hope for women's representation in politics? Yes, I've, got, I've seen a lot of policy change, especially in Zimbabwe. You know, the role played by the Nani governmental organization, they influence a lot of pol policy change in terms of, you know, the role of women in the, in, the, in the political scene. And they have influence in all many dimensions, in many sectors. So I think women have played a greater role, especially women outside you know, active politics. But there's one thing that is amiss, that we are moving on a parallel line, where you know, we have politicians on the other side, with the human rights and you, you, you women's group activists on the other side. And we have never got to a situation where we come together mm -hmm. and we fight as one. And this is what is required in Zimbabwe. If you look at the background where we have some freedom fighters who are going through the same experience that even today's women is going through, the issue of discrimination, the issues of rape, the is they can be shared more with the, you know, the existing organization because it's a replica, whatever is happening, the kind of oppression, it comes from, so you know, right from the struggle. Working together is critical. Working, working together is critical, and it's very critical in the sense that uh, if you look at the situation in Zimbabwe today, uh, the, the looking at, the giving an example of the, the just ended elections. Honestly, instead of rising up 33 years after independence, if you look at the percentage of the elected members, it was almost 12 percent. And because of that constitutional quota system of 60 seats, we have 25. 
percent. But it's 33 years after independence, mm. when we have women in majority, we always claim that we're 52 percent so is in terms 25 of population. And you are saying good, uh, for Zimbabwean women, we are advantaged in the sense that we have gone all through the process. We held the gun. We didn't escape rubber bullets. Mm. We participated. We played an equal role even in the bush. But when we came to power sharing table mm. after liberation struggle, then that's where the discrimination started from. So I think we need to claim back what is ours, right from the start to what we were, we are. And I think what we need, we need to fight as one. You know, there's this problem where Zimbabweans have been let down because we do undermine each other and it, we undermine the work that we do, uh, we undermine our roles. I'm telling you, and women have created that platform because they know with that situation they can rule. So what we need is that to come together and build a strong force that can be able to, to forge ahead with them. And, and I think Rabia gave us the example that there are men who are willing to walk mm. this path with us. Yes. And, and so togetherness is, is really yeah. critical. Uh, Rabia, sure. let me come to you now. And Tunisia is still on the path. It's still mm. moving and bubbling with all this energy, changing, fast changing. Um, in this environment, that is still a challenging environment for leadership. What for you is exciting in terms of the space that could be created or is being created for women in politics? First of all, I have to say that I, when I listened to uh, DJ experience, I figured out that my decision to run for parliament is too late. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, as you said that women should uh, use her position as a parliamentarian, as a president, as a vice president. She has to use her position in order to increase awareness about gender equality and about women's position in every field. It's not only the political field, every field in the life. So you have to look for allies. As I said, you have to look for feminist men because as we say, one hand does not applaud. One hand does not applaud. We have to look for other hands in order to do and to achieve our goals. And actually Tunisia now is in process of revolution. And I think that because of or thanks to the, the powerful women in Tunisia, I really believe that we're gonna win. And I know that most of you know about Tunisian women, and we lately uh, celebrate the, uh, the National Day of Women in Tunisia. And believe me, I saw of many, of many of me women there in the streets mm -hmm. in one word. We want freedom, we want equality, because uh, people governing that now in Tunisia, they, they really use, let me say, they, they use religion to oppress women, and I think that religion and Islam is innocent from these people and innocent from their deeds. So ladies, to wrap up now, I'd like each of you to look into that camera. And Africa moving forward means women and men moving forward together. I want you to give us a vision of your ideal Africa and directly tell the Africans watching this show, what must we all do collectively as women and as men to get to our ideal Africa? Margaret, I start with you. First of all, I think men and women should fight hard to make sure that they change the life of, uh, of, of um, the well-being of, 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 of people in Zimbabwe with more emphasis to to, to Zimbabwean women. And the other issue that I would want to see happen is that uh, women should stop crying about, you know, uh, representation, uh, representation, uh, being uh, appointed to positions or quota systems. I think it's high time women should fight. We need action. It's high time we should go back and conscientize our people. I think what we will need to develop is a program where we start to do walk and talk with our grassroots people. 
I think somewhere we are missing the point. We need to go back on the drawing board and re-strategize to find out where we have gone wrong. Because it's, it's, it's high time that we sh should be, you know, governing as partners, women and men. There's no reason why women should be crying foul every time because we have participated in every effort. As I've said, right, right from the liberation struggle. And apart from that, in Africa we've had a lot of conflicts. And the effects of these conflicts are, had, are heavily felt on women. And I think, we, I think this time women, men have to realize that women have got an important role to play. And women themselves, they have to realize the power that they have. Women have power, but they don't want to use that power that they have. And it's high time that women should come together and re-strategize and see how they can make the, their power become meaningful. Thank you so much for that, Rabia. I want you to look. The camera is just going to position itself direct on yeah. you. So you're speaking directly to the okay. audience. What must we all do as women and men to get yeah. ourselves to the ideal Africa? Yeah. To women and then men. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I want to say that um, it's only the first step which is hard. And if you do the first step, the other millions million steps that you're going to do are becoming easier and easier. Just do the first step, have the gust and the bravery to do it, and uh, everything is going to be easy. For women, uh, men is not your enemy. Men is your ally. So you have to raise the awareness of men in our community that we have to go hands in hands so that we can change our society. Uh, you can start, if you are not satisfied with what's going on in our community now, you can start with your children. As a mother, you can start to raise the, the gender equality with your children and to raise uh, their belief that women have a strong and important position in this life. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You get the final word, Gigi. Yes. Look into the camera. What's your message to Africa? Thank you. And holistically, three things, Julie. I envisage an Africa where everybody will be given a chance to succeed regardless of their gender, disability, misfortune, skin color, educational background, economic background, and any other obstacle. The second thing, I envisage an Africa where women are active agents of change. They are not the missing face in decision making. They are not on the periphery of the political system. And there, isn't, there aren't any barriers and obstacles culturally, religiously, socially, economically that, ina that disenable them to achieve their dreams and to realize their goals and ambitions. And the last and very important, I envisage an Africa and a world at large made up of individuals who are proud to be citizens of their respective countries, who are accountable, who are responsible, who are active agents of change. And know that each and every one of us, regardless of where you are in the world, your age, your gender, or your current situation, you have a social responsibility to change the world, to contribute positively to society, you have the responsibility not to point a finger at anybody else, but to ask yourself, what am I doing? And you have the responsibility to get up and do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. I'm inspired, and I feel it. Do you? Thank you. What fascinating thoughts from a cross-generational panel. Um, I'm inspired. I think there's hope for Africa with such incredible young minds as well. I hope you're inspired too. Let's take a look right now at your views on women's representation in political leadership across Africa. This week, we asked you, in your own view, do women have a role in the political affairs of a country? 
Maureen Wangare Miner says, Yes, they have a role to play. However, being a politician should not be a reason to fail in their role as a woman in the society. They should still be the pillars of their families, taking care of all matters in the basic unit of a society. Stevens Biko says, Yes, women are good advisors and they make decisions in a motherly manner. For saving the nation just like the society, I hail the leadership of a woman. Marcin Jaroge says, Women are the bedrock of society. They should be involved in setting the political agenda. To take part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. Thank you for sharing your views. As always, we appreciate them. Let's keep the conversation going. Right now, it's time for Africa's top 10, and we're looking at the top 10 countries across the continent in terms of women's representation in parliamentary bodies. Let's have a look. On Africa's top 10 this week, we look at the countries that have exceptional women representation in the legislature. This data is based on information provided to the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, by national parliaments by 1st July 2013. 189 countries were sampled worldwide. Starting off the countdown at number 10 is Tunisia. The North African state stands at position 35 globally with a women representation percentage of 26.7%. At number 9 is Ethiopia, with a women representation of 26.7% in the lower house and 16.3% in the upper house. It stands at position 33 globally. Coming in at number 8 is Burundi. The country stands at position 27 globally, with a 30.5% women representation in the lower house and 463 in the upper house. Uganda comes in at number 7. The country is ranked at position 19 globally with a women representation of 35%. At position 6 is Tanzania with a women representation of 36%. It is ranked at position 18 globally. Taking the number 5 position is Angola. It stands at position 15 globally with a women representation of 38.2%. Standing at number 4 is Mozambique, with a women representation of 39.2%. It is ranked at position 12 globally. South Africa comes in at number 3. It has a women representation of 42.3% in the lower house and 32.1% in the upper house. The country is ranked at position 7 globally. Taking the number 2 spot is Seychelles. With a women representation of 43.8%, it is ranked at position 5 globally. At number 1 this week is Rwanda. It is impressively ranked at position 1 globally. This East African nation has 56.3% women representation in the lower house and 38.5% in the upper house. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. It's important to note that the top country in the world in terms of women's representation in parliament is an African nation. It's Rwanda and kudos to Rwanda for setting that example. But what's also important is to note that out of the top 10 countries across the globe in terms of women's representation, three are African nations, namely South Africa, Seychelles and of course Rwanda. So things are not quite as bad as we imagine that they are. There is always hope and we close today with a quote from a woman who inspires many across the continent. It's our very own Grasha Michelle and she said, my challenge to each of you is that you ask yourself what can you do to make a difference and then take that action no matter how large or how small. And so don't get started tomorrow, do it today. Ask yourself, what can you do to make a difference and start to take those steps, however large or small they may be. Thank you, Grasha Michelle, for those words. From me, it's good night and blessings to you and blessings to Africa.